Hi, I'm Dori Shafrier. And I'm Kate Spencer. And we are the hosts of Forever 35. And today we're talking about Club Med, the best all-inclusive getaway for families. Today, Club Med has nearly 70 resorts worldwide, from beachside resorts in the Caribbean and Mexico, to magical locations in the Maldives and Morocco, to ski resorts in the mountains from Canada to the Alps. Between their all-inclusive family programming, wellness offerings, land and water sports, and their French heritage-inspired food and drink offerings, Club Med is the best way to elevate your family getaway, no matter which location you're at. To learn more, visit clubmed.us. Hey guys, it's Mishi. We'll be back soon with another new Israel Story episode. But in the meantime, we wanted to share an update. One of our all-time favorite stories. The Queen Rania Tree. Back in the early months of the pandemic, we ran a series of live update interviews with some of the most memorable people who've appeared on the show over the years. These events took place on our members-only Facebook community, which, if you haven't yet done so, I really hope you'll join. In any event, many, many Israel Story fans tuned into these live interviews and got to ask their questions directly. But since we are a podcast after all, we also wanted to share some highlights of these updates with all of you, our listeners. So today we're going to play the original story followed by an edited and shortened version of the update event we held. If you've never heard this story, or haven't heard it in years, we hope you listen and enjoy. And if you want to skip straight to the update, just go to the last 10 minutes or so of this episode. Okay, without further ado, here's the Queen Rania tree. You can't date without being married. That's like the... Islamic way. You can't date someone without marrying them. So it's like the ultimate let's play Russian roulette with your life uh, way of marriage. It's like, well, you really, well, let's get married and then let's date. Ghazi al is a Palestinian American writer and director. He was born in a refugee camp in Jordan. And then when he was two months old, the family moved to Brooklyn. That's where he grew up. And he is a Brooklynite through and through. Ghazi's family is Muslim, but he's not religious. And that's part of the reason why, at age 34, much to his parents' chagrin, he was still unmarried. In the Arab custom, the oldest son usually is the head of the family. That is the case here with me. Arabs will say Abu, which is father of, and then the name of the first son. In my case, for my dad, it's Abu Ghazi. He walks around with this title attached to me, (laughs) whether he likes it or not. When you call someone Abu something, it's a sign of both respect and familiarity. But it also creates this inextricable link between the father's identity and the accomplishments and failings of his eldest son. Now, Ghazi's single status is definitely seen as a failing. And in Arab culture, it's a failing for the same reasons as it is in Western culture. Basically, people wonder what's wrong with you. And if you've ever been single in your 30s, you know what that's like. For Ghazi, that pressure to get married is worse. It's kind of like a scarlet letter. He's walking around with this name attached to a son who is not married. Every time his relatives or those around him ask him anything, it's like, so, oh, how's your son? Did your son even know? Basically, it depresses the guy. His parents offered to find him a nice Muslim girl, but Ghazi refused. The last thing he wanted was to get roped into an arranged marriage with someone too religious. So his parents nagged him for years. And then Ghazi's dad got sick. So he had cancer of the kidneys. They removed one of his kidneys. The second operation, we removed the other half. I'm walking home with him from the hospital, and he just stopped me at a stoplight. And I remember exactly where it was like court, court and Warren in Brooklyn. And he turns to me as we're waiting for this light to change, and he he turns, he goes, you know, I want to see your children before I die. That statement right there propelled me to do things that I'd never thought I would do. So I did something very impulsive. I um, had a conversation with my mom, which I never thought I would have with her, but I was like, look, I want to compromise with you guys. I want a woman who is more on the modern side of things, we're Jordanian, Palestinian. I think Queen Rania 
of Jordan is amazingly beautiful. If I can find someone like Queen Rania of Jordan, I would be so happy. And so my mom's exact words, Queen Rania, yeah, her family's from Tulkarem, where our relatives live. I'll tell you what, in Tulkarem, it's like going to a lemon tree. You could pick all the Queen Rania's you want. You could just pluck them out. And she did this thing with her hands where she mimed plucking a Queen Rania off a tree. And I'm like visualizing like beautiful women hanging like Queen Rania on a tree that I would just pluck out when I got there. So I book a ticket. I fly into Ben Gurion where I was proceeded to be interrogated. And I have my American passport. An American passport has some cachet to it. It's not just any passport. It's America's passport. So I kind of walk up and then there's this girl directing people to either passport Israeli control or other international visitors passport. So I walk up to her. She looked at my thing. She looked at me. I, she, I now know she sees the Arab name. She goes, uh, what is your purpose to coming to Israel? I said, uh, oh, I'm going to go see my family in Tulkarem. Tulkarem? Go over there. Go to that. And I turn around and I see this little room with just, it was like, it's the equivalent of like a smoker's room, you know, and they have these like see-through windows where people can go in and just smoke. It's such a sad thing. You just see people pacing around, smoking, and just no one is smiling. No one's talking to each other. This was the same room, but it was just full of Arabs waiting to be questioned by immigration, Israeli immigration. And then you're in the little room, you're kind of hanging out, and you're wondering, well, why are these other people in the little room? I mean, I can understand the guy with the beard named Muhammad who was there. I was like, all right, dude, you, I mean, come on, you, you, you know, what were you expecting? I mean, there's no way they're going to let you through. Um, so you start judging other people in the little room. Um, and then there was this one um, white European girl. Why are you here? And she was like, oh, I took Middle Eastern studies back in Oxford. I was like, oh. So they're like, it's like she just took the wrong class in college and she ended up in the little room. So I didn't feel bad after that. Six hours later, Ghazi gets out of the airport and into a cab. The cab driver is Israeli, so he can't go into certain areas of the West Bank. So he stops at the checkpoint near the entrance to Tulkarem. He lets me out, takes so much money. I grab my suitcase, I turn around, the guy is like, literally dirt is flying in the air, he's already gone. And I'm like, what the, what the fuck is going on? And I'm walking towards the checkpoint, and now I'm walking towards soldiers with a huge suitcase who are literally looking at me with their guns up. Not pointing at me, but they're like, kind of like, what is this fucking guy doing? And I'm like, oh shit. This is when it dawns on me that you are, this might be a really big mistake, you should not have left Brooklyn. I get to the checkpoint thing, they look at me, they look at my passport, and they let me in. So I go into Tulkarem and I grab a taxi there, go to what my father told me to go to, which is a section of the refugee camp that my family lives in, Harat al balauna neighborhood of the Balauna. The Balauna is my family tribal name, and that is where I pull up and, you know, meet my family, and then eventually they start taking me around to meet women. I think that first day we went to see two girls. So in Western cultures, you have these dating rituals. The first date you go for coffee or a drink, never dinner. You ask each other the same boring questions. And you basically know in 20 minutes whether or not you're interested. In Arab culture, there's also this matchmaking ritual, but it's a little different. Here's how it works. You sit down, there's the men of the girl's family on one side of the, the living room. My family guys sit on one side. And then you're just kind of waiting there. You kind of small talk. Um, people are like chain smoking these rooms. And like, I'm like from New York. I'm like dying here. Um, and then eventually the girl, and, and it's almost every time verbatim, and the girl comes out with a tray of drinks. She serves all the men. The last drink is for you. She makes eye contact with you, then sits with her relatives. And then you just sit and you just stare at each other like something's supposed to happen. It's such a weird thing, but a lot of these girls would come out of these rooms, and I'm thinking Queen Rania all the way. I'm thinking this is going to be a hot girl coming through this door. And the first woman he met was beautiful. Turned out to be my 17-year-old second cousin. She was actually kind of cute. But the cousin thing was a deal-breaker for Ghazi. And from there, things kind of go downhill. The whole time you're there, you're like, this is really not what I signed up for. I sat with one girl, Islamic girl, who asked me, um, do you pray? Because they made us sit, you're allowed to like 
sit with the family and then you can sit privately, but her brother is sitting in a room like watching you. It's like a double date with the brother who is like so like intensely Islamic, like staring you down kind of. And so this girl um, who's a pharmacist, uh, so you could go, oh, she's like a scientist. And she goes, oh, do you pray? I said, no, I, I really, I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm not going to lie. I don't pray. She goes, oh, you're going to go to hell. And I was like, okay, well, that just kind of just killed any kind of thought of this going anywhere. Not that it was, but we've been on many dates in New York where it's not, you're going to go to hell. It's, can I get the check, please? All right, I guess she's not into me. This was like, you're going to go to hell. I guess that's Tukaram's version of, can I please have the check? A week goes by, a week and a half. Ghazi's going from house to house, drinking tea, meeting women, but his efforts are fruitless. On top of that, the conditions of the refugee camp are really starting to get to him. The refugee camp is just like such a depressing thing. Kids with no shoes on, people are poor, dirt everywhere. I would take three showers a day. Nice Jewish settlements with nice clean houses across the fence, which I watch every day. And I, I wish, why couldn't my family have been Jewish settlers? Why? Why? So um, I had a nervous breakdown. A nervous breakdown being you cry, scream, and then uh, walk through a refugee camp uh, just cursing yourself. Eventually, Ghazi's cousin finds him wandering around the refugee camp, weeping, and he brings him back home. We come back, and then, like, someone goes, look, there's this girl. Let's just go see her. She's at an amusement park with her mom. We know her. We already talked. We're gonna, they're going to meet us there. So I go with my cousin and my, my niece. I'm not expecting anything. I'm already, like, checked out. I'm already going. I'm going back to New York. That's it. I'm done. I kind of did what I had to do here for my father. Get to the amusement park, meet the mom. She goes, oh, she's with her sister on the Ferris wheel. Why don't you go see her, you know? All right, so I walk to Ferris wheel. And it's a Ferris wheel supposed to do a 360. It's supposed to do circles, but this is to cut them. The Ferris wheel is not doing 360s. It is doing a 180. So it would go up and then come down like a crescent moon. And I'm thinking, all right, is this like some Islamic thing where it's like doing a crescent shape? No, and I talked to someone, it's like, no, man, man. It's like everything is breaking down in here. The bumper cars are not bumping. They had like a zoo. The snake died, they told me. It's like so sad, the conditions there. I mean, I mean people need... And so... Anyway, so I'm trying to figure out what this girl looks like because the, the Ferris wheel is coming down, going up, coming down, going up. And now I'm fixated on a very overweight girl. I'm like, great, that's her. So the Ferris wheel um, thing stops and people start getting off. And it's the overweight girl passes, doesn't say anything. I'm like, okay, it's not her. But this girl gets out and I like focus on her. And the girl looked like Audrey Hepburn. She wasn't wearing a hijab. Very Western looking, had really cool looking jeans. I say hello to her. She's a little shy. I'm like, it's understandable. This girl doesn't want to say anything to me, right? We walk back to her mom. I sit with her mom. We're talking. The conversation turns to, you know, whatever. Would you ever let your daughter go to live in America? I live in New York. It's really nice there. Mom's like, yeah, totally. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a done deal there. I was like, oh, if the mom is agreeing to this, it's cool. Um, I'm walking back with my cousin. I'm like, dude, done. Let's just, I'm ready. Let's get the guys. Let's just do this. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dori Shafrier. And I'm Kate Spencer. And we are the hosts of Forever 35. And today we're talking about Club Med, the best all-inclusive getaway for families. Today, Club Med has nearly 70 resorts worldwide, from beachside resorts in the Caribbean and Mexico, to magical locations in the Maldives and Morocco, to ski resorts in the mountains from Canada to the Alps. Between their all-inclusive family programming, wellness offerings, land and water sports, and their French heritage-inspired food and drink offerings, Club Med is the best way to elevate your family getaway, no matter which location you're at. To learn more, visit clubmed.us. And now, back to our update episode. That next day, we go to the house. We do the sit-down with the men. We do this kind of ketubah. 
Kutubut in, the, in Arabic is kitab, kind of um, haggling back and forth of how much money do we put for the Mekedim, which is what, what do you put forward if she were to get divorced, which is just to protect a woman in Islamic law. 10,000 dinars, which is about $15,000 back then, as I was told. Done deal. Let's sign. Next morning, we go to the Islamic Sharia court, and then I sign this wedding contract, and I sign it in front of the, the judge there, the Islamic judge. And now Ghazi, and let's call her Farah, are legally married. They met the other day, and now they're married. So now they're allowed to be alone in a room together. At that point, her family starts to allow me into their house because I wasn't allowed to. I was like a stranger, but now I'm like the son-in-law. So Ghazi's staying with the family for a few days while they make arrangements for a big wedding party. And one night, Farah walks into his room. She comes in and she goes, oh, I want to show you pictures of my, my brother, who her brother's a, a police officer in training. She comes from a, a cop family. And she opens up this f- folder and there's a bunch of photos in there. It's just photos of her brother doing kind of like an obstacle course. He's climbing the rope. He's like running. It's hot out. You can see guys with their shirts off. And then at a certain point, it's him posing with a shirt off. And then him posing with a shirt off with a gun, like a machine gun, cigarette in his mouth, like seductive pose. And then she turns to me, she goes, isn't he tasty? I'm like, huh? Isn't he tasty? And she goes, can't you see why all the girls want him? I'm like, but the way she said it, I'm like, what the hell, Jess? It's like the fourth day and I'm like, this family is nuts. And at this point, Ghazi's also beginning to realize that the family is using him for his money. I'm buying them stuff, buying them groceries. They're asking me. I'm like, this is weird. This is not, you're, as an Arab guest, usually Arabs are supposed to be, you're the guest. You're not supposed to buy anything. This is the opposite. So Ghazi makes the decision. We're going to go buy a wedding dress the next day. If she asks for an expensive wedding dress, I'm done with her. I'm going to tell her I can't marry you. And sure enough, the dress that Farah and her mother pick out is really expensive. I kind of was like, tell her we're going to another wedding gown store. I think that's a little little high. Mother comes out, doesn't look happy. My wife comes out, doesn't look happy. Start walking, silence. And I turn to my wife. I'm like, what's wrong? Oh, you know what's wrong. You shouldn't have upset my mother. She said it in such a way that I just stopped without, it's been building up. I was like, you know what? Can't do this. I divorce you. I've had enough of you. Turn around. That was the last, I left her in that shot. That was the last time in my life I ever saw this girl. I walk to the refugee camp, right, from, from the town center. I tell my uncle, I got to get out of this. So don't worry, don't worry, stop, stop. You, 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 like, don't cry. I'm like crying. I'm like 34-year-old guy crying. I've been like robbed at gunpoint in Brooklyn, and I never cried then. I peed on myself, but I didn't cry. And here I am like walking through this road, just crying, just like grown man crying. It's like, stop, don't cry. I know this great lawyer. I'm like, who, 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 who is this l- 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 lawyer? He goes, don't worry. He's the best in all of Tulkaram. His name is Arafat Arafat. I'm like, so, like, it was enough to make me stop crying and go, Arafat Arafat? He's like, yes, Arafat Arafat. He's the best lawyer in all of Tulkaram. So Ghazi walks back into town to meet the lawyer. The guy's wearing like shorts, like a Mickey Mouse t-shirt or something. And he's like, tell me, what, what happened? I was like, Arafat, Arafat, this is what happened. He goes, did you enter her? And he made a, a hole with his finger and he put the... I said, no, I tried to. I wish I had entered her. He goes, okay, that's good. That's good. And he sits back in his chair and he thinks, that's good. I said, listen, I got to get out of here. I've had it. I'm nervous breakdown. I've been crying. Look at my eyes. He goes, why were you crying? Because men don't cry. It's like, so she's like, this is too much for me. He goes, don't worry, I'm going to make it all better. He goes, sign this. It's a power of attorney. I will be you here in Tulkaram. Go back to America. I will take care of this for you. And then I go home and I get this call from her uncle, the chief of police, who, as I know now, is a nut job. He has had people's legs broken for, for my wife, just whistling or like saying something to her in a, in a, like a come on way and sending people to like break their legs. Like two guys ended up in wheelchairs for like, two months or something like that, some weird beat down. Now, this is the guy that's calling me that's saying, oh, I'm going to send the police car to come get you, and we should really talk about this because you're not just going to leave her here like this. I'm like, I started freaking out. This guy's going to kill me. I said, listen, I'm really emotional. I can't talk right now. I need to drink some tea, relax. I'll come see you in the morning. He goes, you're, you're going to come in the morning? I said, yeah. I said, where am I going to go? I'm in Tulkarum. He goes, all right, 
I'll send a car for you in the morning. Hung up the phone, ran into my room in that refugee camp, house of my uncle's, packed that suitcase up. Everyone had gone to sleep. And I just lay there with the suitcase, holding the suitcase like, like it was my mother. And every time a light would come under the door, I think, they're coming for me. They're coming. They're going to come get me. And I wait. I know the buses start running at like 5. I pick up that suitcase. I don't even say anything to my relatives. I run through that door. And now I'm running through the refugee camp. It's like semi-dark. The sun is coming out. People are, chickens are like cackling. And I'm running with the suitcase on my head. And I'm like running through alleyways. People are in their underwear. I see people through windows. I see people having breakfast. I see the news. I'm like running through dark alleys. And I get to the bus. Get on that bus, that yellow bus. I remember getting on that bus. I'm like, oh, please don't let them stop this bus at the checkpoint. Got past the Palestinian checkpoint, get to the Israeli checkpoint. Now we're on our road. End up in Ramallah. And then he makes it to Jerusalem, where he gets a hotel room and hides out until his flight back to New York. Meanwhile, the men from Ghazi's family and Farah's family hold a meeting to discuss the divorce. Because this is not just an issue between two people. When Ghazi abandoned Farah, he didn't just mistreat her. This was an affront to her family. And then it came out that I had, in my hysteria, told someone in town that she's having sex with her brother. I said, she's not going to have sex with me. She's having sex with her brother. Because like, I'm having a nervous breakdown. This, like, coupled with the fact that I just divorced her, got back to the brother. So the brother said he had dishonored our family by saying I had sex with my sister. I issue a fatwa against this guy. If he is to show his face in Tulkaram at any point, I will kill him dead in the street. The men in my family didn't really put up a fight. They said, this is our son. We really would hope you reconsider. About a week later, Ghazi makes it back to Brooklyn, fully intact. And he talks to his dad about what happened. Oh, it was like nothing. It was like, you'll, you'll get better. It's okay. It was like such a nonchalant... No, here's a punchline. Was not dying. Yeah. It's now four years later, and Ghazi's dad is still alive. Ghazi is 38, still single, and his parents are still trying to get him married. Not only that, they still want him to marry in the traditional way, the way he did with Farah. He just Jewish guilted me in his own Arab way to get married for him. And, you know, I kind of feel it still. You love your parents so much that you end up hating yourself. And that's where I am today. I love them so much that I hate myself. Look at what I did. I went and I got married and, and I had nervous breakdowns and I hate myself. for do- I shouldn't have not done that. But I did it because I love them. That was the episode we aired back in 2015. Five years later, in 2020, we hosted Ghazi for a fascinating update conversation on our members-only Facebook community. As I said at the top of the show, I invite each and every one of you to join our group. Just go to Facebook and search for Israel Story Community. It's easy, it's free of course, and you'll immediately become part of a vibrant group of Israel Story fans. You'll also be able to watch or re-watch the entire conversation we had with Ghazi. It's about 40 minutes long, but for those of you who prefer to listen, here's a much shorter and edited version of that chat. Welcome to everyone. As you will recall, um, this whole adventure in Tulkarim went horribly wrong, and Ghazi fled in the middle of the night, and there is a fatwa issued against Ghazi and Tulkarim. So I guess, Ghazi, um, the first question on everyone's mind, and definitely on my mind, is have you been back? No, 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 no. I, I mean, I really take those things seriously. Um, there's a whole story behind what happened after the fatwa and after I left and I went back to New York. Because if you remember the story, I hired a lawyer the best divorce lawyer in Tulkarim was named Arafat Arafat. His office was above the fruit and vegetable stand in the uh, produce market area of Tulkarim. And I, I'm not making this up. It was a hole in a cave. When I went in with my cousin to see Arafat Arafat, we ducked down 
we were walking in this cave and I can hear an echo as I was talking to my cousin who's in front of me. So um, what happened was I left Tukaram in a hurry, as you know, but I had not divorced her legally. And Arafat called me up one day and said, look, you owe her 15,000 JDs because in the Ketubah or the Kitab, both are the same, you write a dowry. If you divorce her, you give her this much money so she can move on with her life. Mine was about $15,000. Um, he said, you're not going to pay that. We'll, we'll let her wait it out. It went on for two years. And then one day he called me up and he said, look, $5,000, send it to me. I'll get you divorced. I was so happy after two years of this. Called him in a week. His phone was disconnected and no one in Tulkaram knew where Arafat Arafat was. And my 5000 was gone. My parents eventually got frustrated where they felt the only way that they could get me married, really, again, is to go there, search for him, get me divorced. So that's that whole other part two to the story. So your parents returned to Tulkarim and managed to actually... They went back there. Yeah. Eventually, he got me divorced. And here's the hilarious thing. This is what Arafat Arafat said. After all this two-year thing where I sent him $5,000, the reason he didn't get me divorced in two years is I didn't pay the $12 application fee on top of the $5,000. <laughs> so once your mom secured your divorce, did you all uh, go out and celebrate and then she could uh, once again be on your case to get married? They were ready to try to get me married when I got home after Tulkarab. They were like, oh, well... Uh, what do they say in Arabic? Mafi nasib. Ah, there's no luck on this one. Next one you'll get it, you know? It was really that blasé. How old are you now? 43. And are you married? I am not married. Oh, man. I will soon be married, I think. Really? Yes. Her name is Raquel. Very lucky. Is she Palestinian, Raquel? No, no, no. Raquel is uh, Mexican. Mexican-American. How did that go over? You know what? My mom saw a photo of her. She hasn't met her yet uh, because she 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 lives down in um, in Louisville. You know, I've been, you know, trying to set her up for just mentally getting her ready that she's about to experience something she's probably never experienced in her life with, with my parents, especially my mom, you know? Do you think that the requirements uh, once you pass 40 are uh, s- somewhat lessened? That, uh, you know, your mom just really just wants you to get married, so it doesn't really matter who? Oh, man. Let me tell you. Mid-20s, l- let her be Muslim. Let her be Arab. Let her be from Jordan, from Amman, right? Years go by. Let her be Muslim. That goes down to just let her be Arab. Then further down, let her be a woman. Let her be a woman that has all her teeth. (laughs) And last question comes from Ze'ev in Jerusalem. And he says that your parents um, were clearly so involved in your love life and uh, who you marry, your future family. And what, uh, what expectations or hopes do you have now that you're going to get married for your future family? My expectations for my kids? Don't fuck them up the way my parents fucked me up, you know, just (laughs) basically just let your kids be, you know, I I mean, I don't know what else to say because, you know, to control your children is, I mean, you end up getting married in Tulkaram. I mean, that's what can happen, basically. Um, So it's a warning, really. Well, Ghazi, Mazal Tov uh, on your upcoming wedding. I hope uh, I hope there's a great uh, Mexican uh, Palestinian party in the works for after COVID-19 uh, days. And thank you, my friend. Always good talking to you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Later. Bye. The original story was reported by Shoshi Shmulevitz and featured music by Poddington Bear. The update was produced by Skylar Inman and Yoshi Fields with music from Blue Dot Sessions. Israel Story is produced in partnership with Tablet Magazine. Our staff is Yochai Meital, Zev Levi, Yoshi Field, Skylar Inman, Joel Shupak, Sharon Rappaport, and Rotem Tzin. Jeff Umbro from the Podglomerate is our marketing director. Marie Ruder, Clara Fug, Michael Vivier, and Alicia Vergara are our wonderful production interns. I'm Ishi Harman, and we'll be back very soon with our next episode. So till then, please, stay safe. Shalom, shalom, and yalla bye. Am shuf al hudu fi aynayk Am asma' al-bak 
الإنسان مش شفاف مثل البحر حاسس ما عم شوفك كل إنسان وعلم كامل كل إنسان إلو إيبي دايما في مين يشوفك كزاك Hi, I'm Kara Berry, host of Everyone's Business But Mine, and I am an all-inclusive addict. Enter Club Med, the best all-inclusive for you and your family. With resorts worldwide from their family flagship resort, Club Med Punta Cana, to their only mountain resort in Canada, Club Med Quebec, they have everything you need to relax. With their 20-plus sports activities, wellness programs, you can dine on delicious cuisine and make memories with your family. So book your next getaway with Club Med. Visit clubmed.us or call 1-800-CLUB-MED or your travel advisor.